Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the broadcast this evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator. Fantastic. How are you this evening, sir? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. We are coping with the world, with Nigeria, with um, all sorts of developments. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. I was uh, looking out for you in uh, Wimbledon with all the tennis that was going on that uh, maybe you would show up on the pitch and uh, play a few games with Djokovic or one of the other players. You mean you didn't see me? I was huh? looking, sir. I was looking all you over. You must have been watching the wrong television channel. Mm. <laughs> I was uh, trying to see that. Where is Prof? I do remember you used to play tennis uh, a long time ago, sir. A long time ago when it was on my side. Uh, that, that's still on your side now. I wouldn't say it's not <laughs> on your side right now. <laughs> <laughs> De definitely still on your side. Um, people are living longer in, in, in some parts of the world. So, mm -hmm. uh, but let me take I, you. I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even beat Venus. She'll use me to wipe the floor. So, <laughs> not to talk about, you know, <laughs> any any of those guys, you know. <laughs> How is uh, the Tunisian girl doing? Is she still there? Uh, to be honest, uh, I haven't followed uh, very much this, uh, this week. Uh, my eye had been mostly on um, some of the, the security issues uh, mm. going on around the world as it relates to Africa. Um, mm. But I do want to talk about, uh, I, I do want to bring up uh, the issue of Saudi Arabia uh, now that we're kind of joking about the sports point. Um, but Saudi seems to be doing quite well with the golf that went in there. Um, and what they were doing with golf. Quite a few footballers have also been going in in that direction. And I know sometime in the past, uh, we talked about sports diplomacy and the impact that is having. Now, Saudi Arabia is very much in, in the news about what they're doing along with sports. And um, some have said, is Saudi Arabia just using sports uh, to hide human rights abuses, um, and is it fair to them to 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 use uh, uh, that sort of slant against Saudi Arabia? Or what strategy do you think is at play, sir? Uh, well, while they when they were. When I said the when the global north was uh, dominating the hosting rights for sports, um, whether at Wimbledon or the Italian Open or the French Open, uh, and of course you had uh, all the. Uh, all the athletes from all parts of the world, you know, going to run under different flags. Were they trying to hide their colonial past uh, or what? I mean, obviously, it's the money they made from their colonial past that they were using to dominate sports sponsorship. So you know they can't they they, they cannot I mean I, to me it really doesn't matter um, the issue of why the Arab world because it's not just Saudi Arabia we shouldn't just focus on Saudi Arabia um, I believe Qatar I just finished uh, hosting the World Cup and you are going to see more and more of these things. Um, it's what we call soft diplomacy. 
uh, if you, you want to use what is current to cover the ground that you have lost in the past and draw favorable attention to yourself. And if it's the money you are going to use to do this, then you use the money to do it. Um, there was a time when the Arab world was using its money and became notorious for having the biggest yacht, uh, the biggest uh, and most de well-designed private jets, uh, 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 and owning arrows, um, buying, you know, outspending everybody in buying perfume and so on. And that didn't get them anywhere except ridicule, you know? The, the global north took their money and still ridiculed them. Now, wisdom had prevailed, and uh, hopefully they had lived. I mean, now that the younger ones, the young Arab royal elite um, is taking over from the old timers, and uh, they are being more sensible at playing the game. Now, you know, of course, People who are losing out will look for ways and means of uh, again calling to question the motive behind it. I see it as soft diplomacy. They don't have the army to compete with the global north, but they have the money to acquire sponsorship rights and is the kind of thing which um, we, another sector of the global south, can indulge in. We have a lot of private billionaires now who are, I don't know how, how many years will we say we are behind the Arabs because they are still buying private jet planes. Uh, they are still, uh, uh, to celebrate birthdays, uh, you know, hiring the yacht of uh, nurses and what have you for, for, for two weeks at the cost of an arm and a, 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 and a leg. Whereas that same money, if they have used it, say to, to start what, an African Open, so that again, because all that will cost you is to match what the French Open or Wimbledon is paying in terms of uh, uh, the tennis players' money, they will come. I mean, if uh, I mean Nigeria has now about I don't know twenty, if not more, billionaires, and one of them decides to have a Nigerian open once a year, and the price money is equivalent to what Wimbledon is playing. You think those? You think uh, those? Uh, uh, tennis players will not come to whether Lagos or Abuja or wherever it is, you know, you are going to play those. Uh, they, of course, they will come. They follow follow the money. That's all they, they that's all they care about. And I don't blame them. You are paying for their talent. Um so the I praise the the Sauds and the Qataris you know, who seem to have now found a more sensible way to draw attention to the way which they are spending this money. But you should expect those who are losing out um, to be, to, you know, analyze with heavy sarcasm uh, what the global south or how 
some are, uh, some members of the global south are, are doing. But something I would recommend because it's the cheapest way. You know, you don't spend the money buying I mean, I mean uh, uh, F-16 jet planes when you are not at war or buying, you know, uh, destroyers uh, where the money actually it goes to the, the manufacturers in the global north and they benefit from that money. You don't. You spend the money on soft diplomacy and you get the attention. Thank you, sir. Before I, I uh, move on to the point around security, um, you mentioned royal elites in, in the Middle East, and that brought something up to my mind. There's been a lot of hoo-ha about President Biden and patting King Charles on the back, breaking protocol, and, and all those, those, those uh, 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 kind of things. I wanted to ask your view before I move on to the more serious matters. Sir. What do you think about the breaking of protocol there? Are we seeing a change because it's now a king and not a queen? <laughs> well, all I, will, all I will say is um, <laughs> you British, you probably you should wake up. Don't expect the kind of reverence that was paid to the old lady. Um, when she was, uh, after a while on the throne, she became everybody's uh, grandmother to whom you defer to. Um, I mean, she carried herself uh, very well. Although don't forget that we couldn't really get our attention on the issue of reparations, uh, something which it looks like uh, King Charles uh, will be more responsive to um, our language on reparations. But you know, she was old, she'd been on the throne for such a long time, and, you know, as I said, we all defer to grannies. Um, now, King Charles is, uh, well, uh, I suppose he could claim he's everybody's grandpa. But then we seldom show deference to grandpas and not the same kind of deference we we, we pay to grannies, you know, to grandmothers. Um, and um, so don't expect, uh, especially, you see, when you have known somebody as a prince, um, you have some kind of familiar relationship with him. Uh, when it becomes a king, it's probably a bit more difficult to, to, to um, not to accept, but it probably would not even cross your mind that you are doing something which you shouldn't be doing. And in any case, who determines what you shouldn't be doing towards uh, towards uh, royalty? depending on where you are. The, the, the Belgians have their own king. The Dutch have their own king. Uh, and don't forget, we have also the above the name. Um, so, I mean, the, the British may say, you are not supposed to lay hands on our king. Uh, well, fair enough. Um, but don't expect the whole world uh, to accept your protocol demands as regards you know, uh, your king or your queen. You probably will get away with it with your queen because in every, in, it's a universal culture. You, 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 defy, you, you know, you open the door for the lady, whether she's royalty or not, um, you probably bow 
you know, to, to uh, a female CEO, the way you wouldn't bow to a male CEO. It's, it, it is part of uh, that DNA in us to be more differential towards uh, a lead than towards the good old chap that you could pat on the back and have a drink with. So let me go to uh, some more critical critical issues that maybe you can help us with. And I'd like to crave your indulgence to, to actually also invite um, uh, members of the virtual studio to contribute to this particular point. And it is the issue relating to the Wagner Group in Africa. Um, there's been quite a lot of confusion about exactly what's happening there. And some people are starting to believe some of what we saw may have been staged. However, now we're hearing that uh, the Wagner Group may be planning to leave Africa, uh, given the way that the Russian government has dealt with their leader and uh, with, with some of the funding they were getting. My question, sir, is where does that leave Africa in terms of security? If indeed these foreign backed um, security groups are now leaving the countries that they are operating in, where does that leave African security? Where does that put the individual governments that have been using them? And secondly, how should we be preparing in Africa with the departure of this kind of uh, uh, groups? So I wanted to open with that context and then we start to break it down bit by bit. Uh, what is your view, sir? And to our viewers as well, uh, would like to hear your views. Maybe some of you are involved in, uh, in, in the security um, apparatus of uh, the countries that you're part of. Would like to know what the take is on that, sir. You know, um, I, 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 I will even step, or I will take several steps backwards um, over this Wagner issue. Uh, will somebody try and interpret to us? The news that came out of Russia that Putin met the leader, the commandant of the Wagner Group five days after he initiated that rebellion in Russia. Will somebody try to explain to me why the news from the Kremlin did not break on Russian television. It broke on an overseas television. And it was then confirmed by uh, uh, the Kremlin. Will somebody try and explain to us why we have not even seen uh, the Wagner commandant since that meeting was held in the Kremlin. What is going on? What is really going on? Well, this is very, very Rasputinian. It's very Russian. Um, mystery upon mystery upon mystery. It's all en en enigmatic. And then the spillover into the African theater. There is, there is this over negative interpretation of the Wagner group activities in Africa uh, or in the world, not just in Africa, because there is Syria uh, as well. Um, they are in, they were in Libya, and then you know part of them are in Sudan. 
and as an aside, as an aside, I resent, I resent us, South of the Sahara being called Black Africans. We are the Africans. The Arabs should not grab the section of the continent from us and now reduce us to the status of exceptional African. They are Arabs. We are the Africans. And an I resent them called a Black African. I'm an African period. And so, you know, you have all this. It, it's just really questions upon questions upon questions that we that have no answers, only speculations. Uh, the negative connotation about the Wagner group in the world seem to ignore the fact that, you know, at least two European countries have quote unquote mercenaries operating within their armed forces. Britain goes to Nepal every year to recruit Nepalese to come and fight as a distinct group within the British uh, uh, armed forces, the Gokas. The French have the foreign legionnaires, also a distinct group within the, the, the um, French armed forces. So why the over concentration on negative perception of the Wagner group in Africa or in Syria uh, uh, or in Libya? So really, uh, I, I like your intro inviting our colleagues on the platform to please join in because I have no answers. I am just as baffled as you are uh, on what now happens. But the one thing I will want us to have at the back of our mind is that neither the Western foreign forces who operated in Africa post-independence or even the United Nations ever brought the security that we needed in Africa into their theater of operations. When the Tuaregs moved almost within sight of the capital of Mali, the French sent in the French Air Force and drove them back into the desert. Why did the French Air Force stop? Is it to remind the, the Malians that uh, we have at our beck and call the Tuareg militants in their bases in the Sahara Desert and at prompting, they could come in again. I mean, after all, we saw what the American Air Force and the Marines did to the ISIS in Syria, in Iraq. They made sure they bombed them into submission. And even though there are still, you know, remnants of ISIS all over the Middle East, they really don't pose a threat to any of the uh, uh, any of the uh, Arab countries in the Middle East. Whereas, whether to Mali or Burkina Faso or or, or to Chad, 
these people are there after how many years of uh, French presence. And when you go to the Congo, the D Congo DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, demonstrations calling on the uh, United Nations troops to leave, that they haven't brought them any peace after all these years. The same thing, even the Malians are saying. So while I have no, no, no answer to the question you posed about what's going to happen to those countries post Wagner, if they really withdraw, what's going to happen to them? Uh, I want us to keep it in mind that no military intervention from the outside has ever brought any peace to those countries. Thank you, sir. I think you, you touched um, on, on a key key point there with your example on the Tuareg, because if the foreign governments know when these people are nearing our capitals and they are able to then come out and stop them, surely it means that the foreign governments are able to track the movements of these people and they could help to quash them in any case but they're not doing so. So in a sense, we could say that these foreign governments are controlling, whether directly through Wagner or through their, their satellite capabilities, are controlling the security of the African, uh, within the African nations. How do we break free? And to our guests, we'd love to hear your suggestions. How does Africa break free from the hold of Western governments in our security apparatus and uh, can we do without them i know even even in in, in nigeria there's always talk about uh, asking for help from foreign governments to help to stop um uh, uh boko haram and some of these other uh, uh terrorist groups that operate in the area and in the neighboring countries so the question is what do we do how do we do we break free from this? So if you want to, to contribute to this, please raise your hand. Let me, the team will call that to my attention once I see uh, uh, your hand uh, raised on, on the system. Uh, please bear with me. I'm not seeing the videos of every other person. So if you are raising up your hand by, by show of hand, I may not see you. Um, but on on the on the system, there's a, an option to to signify you want to raise your hand. So please do. When I see that, um, I will I will bring you on. Um, so I sir, can so, see hand. I can see a hand being raised, but I cannot see the name. Or oh, is that you yourself raising the that hand? Could have, that could have been my hand. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see someone saying that we break free by education or by being informed. Um, but, but is education alone enough, sir? Because uh, if people are seeing what's happening, they're able to send their jets in when they're nearing the capital, um, they know where they're pushing these people back to. So I'd, I'd like and, to... And in any case... In any case, who creates these problems for us? Um, ISIS in, in, in Africa was formed after the United States or the Global North destabilized Libya because these forces were in Libya, were under the control of Gaddafi, uh, who decides to use them for its own purpose. But after Gaddafi was assassinated and Libya broke into into a civil war, some of those forces came across the Sahara down south. Also, after the ISIS was blown apart in 
Syria and Iraq. They left the Middle East and headed for, for Africa. So we, we didn't go there to cause any trouble, but then we, we, we became um, victims. We ourselves became victims of the activities of the global north in the Middle East and in North Africa. Um, so it's, um, and, don't, and don't forget the kind of uh, propaganda that Northern NGOs through our own domestic NGOs mount when our governments decide to deal with these people. Issues of human rights are then raised. Um, you, I, I don't know how many of us recall about 10 years ago, the kind of questions that are being raised about the activities of the Nigerian troops uh, on the Boko Haram, that it was, this was a violation of international human rights, a violation of this, violation of that. I, I recall, and I must have said it, um, on this our platform that I served on a, the, a Boko Haram committee and one morning we all woke up and on Agent Front Press, AFP, an issue had then been raised about mass uh, graves uh, uh, in my dogory uh, arising from the activities of the, of the Nigerian uh, troops uh, the day before. Uh, and this was really characteristic that where where is the AFP located? That it is always one that knows what goes on in this area. Within 24 hours, are they turned off? Are they, they are always the one. In any case, on this occasion, we then decided we will fly to Medjugorje. We did, and after meeting with the governor and with the elite of Bosnia, we asked to be taken to um, where these mass graves were, where had they been discovered, and uh, the issue then became, oh, we don't know, we were told, uh, who told you, can you please give us access to them so they could tell us where these mass graves are so we could visit these mass graves. They couldn't. It then became what we were told, we were told, we were told. And yet, the AFP had carried it as headline news. There were no mass graves. This was just done to discredit the activities of the of the Nigerian army, um, the elite in Borno was split itself, and I would say it was split into pro Boko Haram and anti Boko Haram. So, um, we 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 have a problem on our hands. Um, whether we we are we are dealing with Wagner or even the activities of our own national uh, national army. So someone is, is raising a, a very good point here. Um, and they're talking about something called the African High Command that um, you worked on at some point. Um, is it time for Africa to start to consider some sort of uh, African force that maintains peace? Um, which will bring me to another question about ECOWAS. I'll come to that after this before we move on. But is, is this the time to start to think about such a force? Would it be an effective replacement? 
well, um, the concept of an African high command goes back to the days of Fosai Jifo, Kwame Nkrumah. One of the issues he raised in 1962. In fact, he had raised it as soon as Ghana became independent, that we should have an African high command. Um, who bears the cut? Who is going to bear the responsibility financially, personnel wise? Um, one of the issues that had bedeviled and that still bedevils NATO till today is the complaint by the United States that they spend their taxpayers' money maintaining NATO while Western countries spend the taxpayers' money reducing taxes, having national health service, uh, having infrastructural development, and that of the 30 something odd members of NATO, only nine, only nine have met the 2% of their GDP to be devoted to the, their armed forces. Whereas the United States had gone way above that. And that really Amer the Americans were getting fed up carrying the security burden of Europe. Um, that's the American version of it. I mean, there's, there's another school of thought you know, that says, well, yes, but if you're a global power, you have global responsibility. And, you know, carrying financial burden is part of the global responsibility that, you know, comes with uh, being a global power. Now, I know you, you did say something about ECOWAS, but um, I did, ECOWAS is supposed to have a standing military force. It has never succeeded in setting it up, simply because, uh, you know, people are not prepared to put money down. And one of the things when Tinubu says, Nigeria is back, is going to be, is Nigeria going to be prepared to bear the financial burden of an equal standing force? Nigeria bought the financial burden for the uh, Ecomog uh, uh, adventures in Liberia and in Sierra Leone. And uh, uh, the Nigerians again started complaining about that. Um, and um, the mood in Nigeria, even though most Nigerians probably applauded the Nigeria is back statement by their president. Um, if the financial implications are spelled out, I wonder what will be uh, the mood of, um, uh, uh, what will be the body language of Nigeria. So the problem with the Africa High Command, two problems. One, who's gonna pay for it? Number two, who is going to command it? Where would the, the, the authority to deploy the forces, where would that be located? Because at the end of, at the end of the day, uh, a force is, as, is just as good as the command structure. If you decide, uh, to tie one leg of the elephant uh, towards east, another leg towards west, another leg towards north, another leg towards uh, south, you've rendered the elephant useless. Uh, and until that goat will probably be more effective than that elephant. 
So really, um, without uh, uh, without a centralized African government, uh, an African high command is just going to remain a concept whose time has not yet come. But I can see a, a hand raised here. Uh, please bear with me. Let me um, pick that up. Uh, kindly unmute yourself, sir. You've got two hands. Two hands I can see now. Yes, mm -hmm. let me go with uh, the first one I can see here. Dr. Dako Thomas, can you please go ahead, sir? All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, the African High Command and ECOWAS, if we have to draw parallels, we talk of NATO and possibly, you know, at the uh, Western level. The first thing I see that stands against Africa as in, I mean, as uh, a unit, or that can prevent us from having a cohesive front is lack of political will. Um, most of our leaders don't have the political will to subscribe or to submit their national sovereignty or their national uh, independence to any central authority. So it will be very difficult to achieve that, to achieve a situation where we will ask an African country to subscribe to one central authority when the dynamics for such operations uh, are not clear. So there will definitely be, the political will is not there. Uh, otherwise, I mean, Prof had already said it, that Tinkwema mooted the idea of Africa High Command since 1960. So if the will had been there, we will not still be talking about this 60 something years after. You know, we won't be talking about uh, this 60 something years after. So that's the major problem, and uh, which I don't know how they are going to solve to resolve that. Then the second one, for uh, Prof has already spoken extensively on that, that's funding. Uh, and I, I was about to raise the issue of uh, NATO. You know, that was serious complaint. There was a serious complaint made by Trump when he came to office, that NATO, uh, other allies are just feeding on US funds. And as such, he increased. That they should also increase their own uh, levy and everything. So in, uh, in Africa, the level of poverty is not likely to allow any, to allow all, most of the nations to contribute. Most of the things we just be experiencing will be rhetorics. You know, when it comes to, um, contributing money for this particular purpose, it's going to be a very tough order. And then again, where is the discipline? Do we, do uh, the Nigerian, I mean, African military, do they have the discipline that you can talk about, you know, in uh, uh, NATO, among the NATO nations? They have a discipline, they have a central command, and they all subscribe to the leadership of that central command. They have a, an executive secretary, they have everything. But in Africa, I do not see if we have this discipline. And that's why, you see, the first thing that EU would ask you to do is to give you certain conditionalities to, I mean, with which you must ask, you must uh, subscribe to or you must meet before you can talk of uh, accession. Uh, in Africa, as any of these been done, have we ever set conditions that all these uh, nations will have to meet. Because if we don't do that, that's why we, I mean, some some um, uh, nations have military that is so fractionalized that it will be, they, they will now transfer this local politics to whatever we want to form at the, I mean, as I, African High Command. So there will be infighting and there will be leadership crises so the discipline for us is not there as Africans. And then the, 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 religion, the religious aspects, we have a religious problem. 
those people don't talk about Islam. They don't talk about Christianity. But over here, we talk about cultural imperial, I mean, cultural incompatibilities. So all these things are very, very difficult to achieve. The harmonization or maybe trying to align, the, the, the aligning all these differences would definitely create problems for us. And even our own leaders, to what extent, I mean, what, what is the um, respect? What kind of respect do they even have for our constitutions? What respect? You can see Biden sticking to the fact that, look, Ukraine, yes, as much as I'm sentimental towards you joining NATO, there is a standing order. We cannot give you membership when there is a war going on. You yep, cannot. Yep. Yes. But, so you, but, you must have respect for the constitution. Do we have do our leaders have respect for our for, for different constitutions? So if you now come up with a EU constitution or whatever, would they have show any respect for it? So uh, the level of integration is still very, we are still very, very far from that. I mean, like I said on one program yesterday, that look, EU is talking about functionalism. We are still talking about integration. And we are not even moving anywhere near integration. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I can see another hand raised. Um, God knows the galley. Uh, do you want to unmute yourself and, and uh, make a contribution, sir? Or oh, I don't I don't know the but, but please do you want to make your contribution? God knows the galley. Yeah, Ambassador Igali. Ah, okay, sir. Uh, uh Ambassador, sir, I can see your hand raised. Process, yeah, thank you very much. Fantastic. Yeah, um I'm a little bit troubled on this conversation of uh, African High Command and the great extent of pessimism that has been expressed. I don't think it is that bad. We went into ECOMOC without much of international support. And many of us were, at the time, middle-level persons in the diplomatic uh, system in Nigeria. And a lot of the burden, uh, maybe perhaps with concern, was uh, shouldered by Nigeria. But we looked at it from two points of view, from the point of view of the fact that uh, a threat to any African country, uh, dismemberment, threat of dismemberment, and threat, threat of uh, disintegration uh, was a threat also to Nigeria's own national interest. And along with Ghana, and other partners were able to go to ECOMOC almost without much of international support. Fortunately, at the time, there was some windfall from oil. I think what is important is for us, the second aspect was the fact that this was something that we had to do for fellow African countries, apart from the threat it posed to us. Now, what is important from the ECOMOC experience is for us to have a rapid deployment force that is lean not too complicated to handle, which, yeah, definitely one country will bear the burden. And unfortunately, in this case, it's with Nigeria, particularly within our sub-region. But we can make it lean and uh, start it. <laughs> it's not possible for us to have a perfect situation where there is a cultural homogeneity or religious homogeneity and uh, with the linguistic differences and so on. Yes. So before we go into doing what we need to do. I'm not advocating for a high command that's grandiose, but a rapid... Uh, go ahead, sir. I think we've lost your audio. Um, while we see that, can you still hear me, Prof? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I think we lost uh, Ambassador Gali there. Um, but there's a comment here from um, uh, Professor Paoli. Ambassador, are you back, sir? No, I think I think we've lost him. There's a comment here from Professor Paoli. Says an African High Command is for now a mirage. And mistake must not be made to equate any such with NATO 
or the defunct Warsaw Pact, for that would be a false equivalent. NATO is cohesive. Uh, if you bear with me one second, sir, can the team please mute every other person, please? Um, one second, please mute every other person. Yeah, and it, it says um, because it had and still has a common enemy, and that is the reason for the uh, deter the genito. Does Africa have a common enemy? Perhaps not. So any continual force would only be at the behest, at the best, a peacekeeping, peace and enforcement force who would use and still be subjected to political determination. So I think um, we can see uh, Professor Fawole here who is disagreeing with the need for um, an African high command. But I do ask a question, sir, because uh, only this week uh, we see a cross-party team in the United Nations, uh, across Democrats and Republicans, reinitiating their move to stop the United States, any president from the United States, from leaving NATO. So it seems that there must be in some quarters uh, a group who are looking for how they can keep the United Nations um, the keep NATO and the United States within NATO. But when we put that side by side with what Professor Fawole has just said here, it seems that Africa does not have a common enemy. What is your view, sir, okay. Professor? Can you hear me? Well, um, you. My, my body language is in alignment, I would say, with Ambassador Igali. Um, let's go back to 1960, 63 or so. If you didn't have somebody like uh, Osajifo Nkrumah or Secretary, or even Gamel Abdul Nasser pushing for continental African unity, you wouldn't have had the OAU information. And think about it as of the time that Africa formed the OAU, Europe was still at the level of talking about economic cooperation, economic integration. They were not talking about European Union. In fact, I used to, uh, uh, when I was teaching at the university at that time, point out that here we are in Africa, ahead of Europe, ahead of Asia, in terms of, you know, having a continental organization. But we were reacting to the pressure from, yes, a minority, but a group pushing for continental unity. They were not going to get it, but if you aim for the moon and you miss, you may hit the stars. If you didn't have somebody like, uh, 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 Gaddafi pushing for African Union at the time when he was perhaps the loudest voice, and some even argue the only voice we might not have had the transmission of the OAU into um, African Union. If we hadn't had the ECOMOG experience. And that is due, I mean, we give, I mean, we must be prepared to accept praise if we are also going to throw punches where necessary. Uh, 
the determination and political will of IBB that is something that has to be done. We are simply not going to have the disintegration of uh, um, Sierra Leone and have the concept of you know a rebellious force taking over government in Sierra Leone and in Liberia and that becoming a virus that may then spread to the rest of West Africa and it has to be nipped in the bud with even without uh without uh, if you like um United Nations authorization we wouldn't have had the come up and if we hadn't had the come up we wouldn't have that confidence to sit here and know that it can be done we probably will still be saying well you know it has never been tried and probably it can't be tried but we went in as ambassador gali said with ghana what he didn't add was that we had opposition from Cote d'Ivoire engineered by the French, but we did. We, we, we achieved the purpose in, uh, we achieved the purpose in Sierra Leone, we achieved the purpose in, um, we achieved the purpose in uh, Liberia. So to that extent, um, I, I, I do agree that, you know, um, African High Command is, 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 is an idea, it's a concept whose time has not come. And therefore, there must be an assessment of what is the uh, mystery that we need to cope with or we need to confront and what mechanism do we need to come up with to confront it and that mischief is already knocking at our door because the initial question which is led to all of this it was put by the moderator the group they are they are they were ready to leave africa then what is Africa going to do? All it's going to take now is the Tareg moving into um, whatever is the uh, rebellious forces moving into the capital of Central African Republic. Um, Burkina Faso become rather shaky for West Africa to say it. We can't like don't one by one capitals falling. We've got something about it. And this is then where the, the concept of rapid deployment force raised by, uh, 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 I mean, put on the table, the ambassador comes in. So it may not be the echo was standing forth, could be called something else. Um, so, uh, um, I rather than be negative about it, I don't, I mean, frankly, in all my own life, I say in the public service, I have never been comfortable with it cannot be done. My attitude has always been, how can it be done? Uh, and you then discover that by the time you debated it up and down, um, you then discover that it actually could be done as of the time. And I think I have said this on our platform here, that the technical lead course scheme, when it was presented at cabinet, I had only two supporters from my fellow ministers, only two. And then at the end of it, IBB simply said, uh, external affairs, you'll find the comments of your colleagues, go and tidy this thing up and don't bring it back to cabinet. 
implement. So in a way, I had only one critical supporter, and that was the president. And today, to, today those managing the technical lead core will tell you that they get more requests than they can meet. There was one time from, Ad, from Ethiopia, they got a request that the government wants to set up a university and they want Nigeria to deploy university teachers from vice chancellor all the way down to come and operate this uh, university. And they had to tell Ethiopia that, uh, no, it's, it's not something we could take on at that, I mean, at that time. But there were a lot of people who thought, come on, who are we? You know, we don't, don't we'll be talking about technical aid cost scheme. Uh, when we still have problems in our and so on. Now, if the United Nations had sent a task force to Nigeria to understudy the technical aid cost scheme and how we pulled it off. So, I, I mean, I, I'm usually an optimist that when there are issues to be tackled, let us think of how to tackle it rather than we cannot do it. Thank you, sir. We lost Ambassador uh, Ugali there. He's put some clarifications uh, in, in the comments. Um, and I think that uh, both of you, sir, must be reading off the same sheet. Um, I'm starting to look at my prompter here to see if everyone is seeing uh, a prompter because he's echoed pretty much the same thing that you said, uh, who helped us to form ECOMOG at the time, um, which is a, a, a key thing. He does say he's not necessarily saying it's an African high command, um, but definitely some sort of uh, rapid intervention force is what I can see here. And um, to the point that uh, Professor Fawale raised, I think Ambassador Ogali is also uh, addressing a key point around the common enemy. Because I, I asked myself, who is the common enemy of NATO? NATO was set up. NATO has the, 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 the strands in all these different countries. They've got their structure. But who is the common enemy of NATO? And maybe, sir, you were right. And what Ambassador Ogali is saying here, uh, is right. And uh, the fact that Nigeria is back, this is the point I wanted to raise, sir. When President Tinumbu says Nigeria is back, what does that really mean? And what would you expect to see from an ECOWAS standpoint of Nigeria being back? Well, number one, we know the was um, copying uh, by this uh, statement, uh, America is back as a counterpart uh, when he became president to the bull in the China shop uh, attitude of Trump towards whatever uh, institution the, yes. uh, um, the United States belonged to, uh, how it became really rather disruptive of the international system. Um, and as he was prepared to turn his back on um, everything positive in American foreign policy, whether it was the uh, nuclear agreement with the Iran or the um, Paris agreement on climate change and that kind of thing, we know that um, uh, actually we, we, the last active president we had in foreign policy was uh, General Lucien Mwabasanjo. Um, unfortunately, we cannot judge uh, um, President Yaradua because he really didn't, he wasn't in good health and he, he didn't live that long for him to put a simple matter on our foreign policy. But Obasanjo was the last 
activist, uh, uh, foreign engager that we had as president. Um, and from then on, we really become a, a facing. Um, I said, we were no longer a regional power. As we've said it on this program, South Africa moved into the void because, you know, uh, international politics does not like vacuum. Somebody will step onto the plate. Uh, now, Tinubu was saying Nigeria will become visible, it will become active. Uh, he pointed out the issue of anti terrorism, uh, anti coup, uh, 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 and, uh, 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 and those kind of things. And one will have to add that uh, to make ECOWAS really effective, there's got to be a push for Africa to um, 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 play the so protocol. Uh, there have been this, uh, uh, you know, there have been this effort at having a common currency in um, ECOWAS called ECO that uh, uh, the French threw a surrogate, then tried to hijack until there was a pushback from several African countries. That is still there. Um, to be achieved. Uh, we really don't honor free boundary movement as we should. Uh, we are rather tardy about um, uh, settlement, you know, the right of uh, citizens within ECOWAS, you know, to settle and do business. So really, that's to me what uh, Tinubu meant by Nigeria is back. Uh, but as I said, Nigerians while clapping for that must, uh, must realize that responsibility goes with financial body. Um, the more you push, the more you should be prepared to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, and you are then going to discover that people who welcome you being back will want you to, to pay. Uh, why? And this is something we should keep in mind because you see, we Africans, because of the way our Pan Africanism developed, we believe we are all equal. Therefore, uh, even when you lack, when a country lacks the capability of providing the leadership that a post deserves, it will still say, it's my turn to be the executive secretary. It's my turn to be the secretary general. Whereas if you look at NATO, the head of NATO is an American general. His deputy may be French or British, but the head is, is always an American general, while the administrative head of NATO is always a European. Um, they've just extended the term of the present secretary general by another 12 months while uh, they, they look for uh, an appropriate candidate who will uh, take over from him. Well, Africa, Pan-Africanism in Africa in terms of its uh, practicality will really have to accept the fact that we are not all equal. There are people who can deploy in Africa, who can deploy an air force, of uh, several, uh, well, do we use battalions to use for air force or what? You know, there are African countries who can put onto the field uh, a whole division of tanks uh, when necessary, when 
where are necessary. Whereas there are Africans who don't even have more than maybe 10 tanks in their own uh, military. Well, you can't start asking uh, uh, an African country that has only 10 tanks in its military to be uh, the general officer commanding uh, mm -hmm. an African force in the well, field. Well, when, I don't know what happened to my teacher. When you have uh, an African with maybe 50 well, men, uh, kind of thing. We, we have it's to marry you know. responsibility with capability, financial or otherwise, in Africa, rather than every African country is equal and, uh, and the same. Thank you. We have someone here uh, at Dewumi uh, who says the common enemy in Africa is terrorism. NATO has its Russia. Africa High Command, I assume that's what AHC means, will have a plethora of non-state actors to deal with. And the one at the fore is terrorism. This particular enemy afflicts all of Africa. No part of Africa is exempt from this insidious hold. Um, let's end, I'm over time, but I want to end sir, with um, any last comments you want to give us about the NATO summit and the outcome of uh, the NATO summit. Ukraine thought it was gonna get a lot more than it did. Um, it's been accused of not being grateful. The president has responded to that. What is your take away from the NATO summit? We end on that. <laughs> okay. Um, number one, uh, I think that uh, the, the, um, Hands of admission, let me put it that way, extended to Sweden is a positive development for NATO. The sense that it, it, it uh, opposed what our attitude on this platform, that there are always diplomatic ways to tackle a problem. Uh, give and take, you know, the, the kind of debates that go on behind the chair that may not be aware of. The, you know, what gets this, what, what, what do we need to give you? Because what people have called this muscle of talking within 24 hours over the admission of uh, Sweden. Let me correct myself. Sweden is not admitted yet. But Turkey dropping its objection means Turkey must have got something in return. And that something will manifest itself uh, as we go along. I remember saying on this program that the solution to the Cuban crisis, only half of it was told to the world. And that half was Russia, Soviet Union was going to withdraw its ships and withdraw the missiles that it had installed in Cuba. The other 50% that we were not told at that time was that Kennedy promised Khrushchev that in six months he would withdraw American missiles from Turkey which was what the Soviet Union had been asking for. And he fulfilled that undertaking. But the understanding was it will not be announced as if the quid pro quo was there. Um, so the quid pro quo for Turkey dropping its objection, we will, it will manifest itself as we go on. So that, that, that was one victory. The other one uh, for, for Ukraine. I believe that Ukraine, you see, I mean, I, I, I can understand the frustration of the president of Ukraine. I can understand his frustration, but I think he deserves the slap on the wrist that he got uh, for uh, 
uh, where it's, it was not even not showing public gratitude. It was, again, the rudeness in his language. Um, I'm not a friend of the president of Ukraine because the, the Ukrainians are racist. And the way in which they talk to we Africans um, does not show any respect for our sovereignty. But he may, he may have a good cause, but with bad diplomacy, the way he goes around insulting people. He even insulted the Arabs as well when you know he addressed them. Um, it's not the best diplomat to have. And I think he deserved the public slap down that the British Defense Secretary gave him. Having said that, I thought that, um, you know, we can play diplomatic games. Biden kept saying, we cannot admit Ukraine because there's a war going on. And if we admit, uh, admit Ukraine, uh, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty will have to be activated. And I say, not necessary. The communique could be what as such a way to say, we admit Ukraine, but Article 5 will not be activated until the end of the war. Who's going to take you to the International Court of Justice for interpretation? No one. Uh, the president of Ukraine needed that as a major diplomatic punch that he needed. Um, but again, they found a way of giving him assurance. And now a Ukrainian NATO council has been set up. Well, yes, again, that's a, a diplomatic uh, 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 victory for him, not as much as he would like to get. And, you know, he could sell that to his people uh, that we didn't come back uh, empty handed. I, I think that um, the issue, I would like us to defer the issue of the say of the uh, supply of the um, what do you call, call those bombs? Um, cluster bombs. Cluster bombs. Maybe we should defer that until next week, so we could get a lot of our members to talk about that. All right, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, sir. Um, I'm just putting a, a, on the back of what you've said there, I'm just putting an email address out uh, on the chat now for everyone. If there is a particular point that you want to see discussed, um, please feel free to send an email to um, the email address that I've put in the chat, info at tmeinsights.com. And we can um, assess that. And if I get it uh, latest by uh, uh, Wednesday evening, uh, 7 p.m. Wednesday evening, I may still be able to accommodate it on the program uh, for Thursday. So please do send an email to info at tmeinsights.com if there are specific points you want to see um, addressed uh, and and I would I would pass that um I see the comment from uh Omoje K. Kelvin uh thank you for that I think that that has been um that has been addressed somewhat we note that um and also please do check uh, in in the comments you would see uh, I think ambassador Ogali has just put something there when president Tinubu says that Nigeria is is back. What I think it means is that we are going to be activists and engaging in our foreign policy. Uh, in other words, we will not be sluggish and reactionary. Gladly, this happened during the time of Professor Akemi when we came up with, with a number of initiatives, uh, particular around uh, concert of medium powers, um, obviously the technical aid score 
with your cops, which you've already talked about, sir. So I guess um, what he's saying is 34 years after Nigeria may be uh, on the brink of another foreign policy uh, uh, breakthrough if some of these initiatives start to materialize. Um, on that note, we'll end the program this evening. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, pleasure. Uh, let me quickly apologize in everybody so I don't get uh, Kane for going over time. Apologies <laughs> for, for going over time tonight. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you to our viewers. Uh, good night. We'll be back next week. Wakanda. Well,